This was the great dream of empire. The promise of acres of virgin land at knockdown prices. Enticed by pictures of the Canadian prairies, my great aunt Agnes and her husband Ernest decided to leave behind their home in Scotland, their family and friends. It was 1911. They crossed the ocean to begin all over again on the other side of the world. Migrants like my great aunt risked not just their savings, but their very lives in pursuit of the imperial dream. According to family legend, Aggie and Ernest were supposed to sail on the Titanic, but by chance only their luggage was on board when the ship went down. To us, their decision to gamble everything on a one-way transatlantic ticket seems extraordinary. Yet without millions of such tickets, some purchased voluntarily, some not, there could have been no British Empire. For the foundation of the Empire was mass migration, the biggest in human history. It wasn't just commerce and conquest that built the British Empire. Between the early 1600s and the 1950s, a human flood of more than 20 million people left Britain and turned whole continents from America to Australia white. The Britannic exodus changed the world, but at its heart, there lay a contradiction. Most of the migrants were motivated by a dream of religious or economic freedom, liberty. The British liked to think that was what set their empire apart from the Spanish, Portuguese or Dutch. But an argument about the meaning of liberty would spark off the first great war of independence against the empire. And for those on the receiving end of British liberty, the millions of migrants seemed little better than a white plague. It all began in the 1600s, when intrepid British pioneers set sail for a primitive land inhabited by barbarous natives. Ireland. It was under King James I that Ireland was first systematically settled by Britons, most ambitiously in the north. Nowadays, we think of this as the start of Ulster's troubles. But James's advisers saw British settlement as the answer to Ireland's instability. The Irish natives, they claimed, were weeds, and Catholic weeds at that. The new settlers would be good corn. It would be a kind of social gardening. The buzzword was plantation. In theory, plantation was just another word for colonisation, the ancient Roman practice of establishing settlements of loyal subjects out there on the political margins. But in practice, the plantation of Ulster implied what we today call ethnic cleansing. From the very beginning, the plantation of Ulster was based on systematic state-sponsored theft. Detailed survey maps spelt out how the native Irish were to be expelled from the best land to make way for British settlers. This was a business proposition. Public-private partnership, Jacobean style. The Crown provided the land, but it was commercial corporations like the City of London who took the risk, investing their cash in the infrastructure of settlement. The Protestant churches and fortifications. These are the walls of Derry, or London Derry as it was renamed in 1610. The defences were shaped like a shield to protect the new Protestant community planted here by the city of London. Catholics had to live beyond the walls, down there in the bogside. Nothing illustrates better the ethnic segregation implicit in the policy of plantation. You were either on the inside or on the outside. 
Inevitably, there was resistance. In 1641, the Ulster Catholics revolted. <laughs> Thousands of Protestants were slaughtered in what one contemporary called a fearful tempest of blood. But the plantation refused to be uprooted. Indeed, it soon began to flourish economically. By the 1700s, Belfast was a boom town. Britain's first colony was here to stay. So Ireland was the experimental laboratory of British colonisation and Ulster was the prototype plantation. What it showed was that empire could be built not only by military conquest, but by settlement, by migration. Now the challenge was to export the model further afield, not just over the Irish Sea, but across the Atlantic. For nearly half its existence, the nation now known as the United States was British. It sprang from the imperial model of plantation. Expectations of Virginia, as Sir Walter Raleigh had named the eastern seaboard around Chesapeake Bay, were high. One poet called it Earth's only paradise. New arrivals came here not to get rich quick and go back home. They came to stay and put down roots. But there was a problem. Virginia was thousands of miles further away than Ireland, and agriculture had to be started there from scratch. The settlers had the further misfortune to establish their first plantation on a malarial swamp. There's not a great deal left of Jamestown, Virginia, but it was Britain's first permanent colony in America. Back in 1607, the pioneers had a pretty hellish time of it. Malaria, yellow fever, plague, meant that after just a year, only 38 of the original 100-strong force were left alive. For 10 years, Jamestown and the future of Britain's American empire teetered on the verge of extinction. With the chances of surviving your first year in British America little better than 50-50, Virginia could only appeal to desperados. The empire in America would have to be saved by very different types, by religious fundamentalists. England had been Protestant since the accession of Elizabeth I, but for those who came to be known as Puritans, it wasn't Protestant enough. What put other people off America, the fact that it was a wilderness, struck those who sought religious freedom as ideal. Where better to found a truly godly society than amid a vast and empty chaos, with no distractions from the good book? In 1620, 41 East Anglian religious dissidents set off in the Mayflower for their promised land. Faulty navigation gave the self-styled pilgrims the cleanest possible slate, because they missed Virginia by 200 miles. They ended up planting themselves on the chillier shores explorers called New England. New England flourished through a combination of Puritanism and the profit motive. Not everyone aboard the Mayflower was driven by religious zeal. In fact, most weren't pilgrims at all, but economic migrants. And what attracted them to New England was the presence, in large quantities, of fish. Exporting salt cod back to Europe was a hugely lucrative business. There was one other magic ingredient in the empire's progress. In New England's temperate climate, the British settlers bred like rabbits, quadrupling their population in just 50 years. Sex really was a key difference between British America and Latin America, 
Solo male settlers, like the Spanish Incomenderos, tended to marry into the indigenous population, going native in the old phrase. But British settlers were encouraged to bring their wives and children with them, and that preserved their culture more or less intact. New England really was a New England, precisely because it was a family affair. Plantations meant planting, not just people, but crops. And planting crops meant tilling the land. The question was, whose land was it? The colonists could hardly pretend nobody had been living here before their arrival. The Virginian colony was smack in the middle of Powhatan Indian territory. The idea was simple, take the land away from the Indians, but being British we had to come up with a nice justification for doing that. And the convenient idea came to mind, terra nullius, which meant in effect nobody's land. The great political philosopher John Locke, who on the side happened to be secretary to the Lord's proprietors of Carolina, argued that a man owned land only if he mixed his labour with it and joined it to something that is his own, which was a sort of fancy way of saying that if you didn't fence it and farm it, it was up for grabs. One Indian chief, Miantanomo, could see the writing on the wall. Our plains were full of deer and turkeys, but these English have gotten our land. They, with scythes, cut down the grass and with axes fell the trees. Their cows and horses eat the grass, and we shall all be starved. Cheap land and abundant natural resources, these were the economic foundations of colonial America. The claims of American Indian tribes simply had no weight in the new economic order, as the British monarchy extended its grip on America through vast land grants. In 1682, Charles II settled a debt of £16,000 by simply giving one of his admiral's sons, William Penn, what became Pennsylvania. Overnight, this made Penn the largest individual landowner in British history, with a backyard well over the size of Ireland. Penn, a Quaker, envisaged a holy experiment of religious liberty in the city he founded, Philadelphia, the ancient Greek for brotherly love. Penn combined religious liberty with business nows. Though I desire to extend religious freedom, yet I want some recompense for my trouble. William Penn was a real estate salesman on a grand scale. He sold off huge chunks of Pennsylvania at knockdown prices. A hundred quid bought you 5,000 acres. This was a powerful lure for settler families freedom of conscience and almost free real estate. But there was a catch. Not everyone in this new white empire could be a landowner. In order to cultivate crops like sugar and tobacco, you needed workers. The question was how to get them across the Atlantic. And here, the British Empire discovered the limits of liberty. From the 1660s, the British Empire, the self-styled empire of liberty, developed an insatiable appetite for slave labor. Millions of slaves were shipped across the Atlantic in horrific floating prisons. There was some spewing, some pishing, some shiting, some damning, some blasting the legs and thighs, some the liver, lungs, lights and eyes. And for to make the scene the order, some cursed father, mother, sister, and brother. Mm -hmm. 
On arrival in America, the slaves were auctioned off like cattle. Just arrived. 139 men, women, and boys. Smiths, bricklayers, plasterers, shoemakers, a glazier, a tailor, a printer, a bookbinder, several seamstresses. These slaves were not black Africans. They were white Celts. While early emigrants to the American Empire had been pioneers, drawn by the prospect of freedom and land, the second wave gave up their liberty by selling themselves into what was, in effect, slavery on a fixed-term contract. It was several years' hard labor with the possibility of a new life as the payoff. They called it indenture. One such indentured worker was a Scot named John Harrower. His journal reveals that emigration was far from a bid for freedom. It was a last resort. This day, I being reduced to the last shilling I had, was obliged to engage to go to Virginia for four years for bed, board, washing, and five pound during the whole time. Just under three quarters of all British immigrants in the 18th century were either Scots or Irishmen. It was men from the impoverished periphery of the British Isles who had the least to lose and the most to gain from selling themselves into servitude. But there were some parts of the empire where even the toughest Scots couldn't go the distance. From 1764 until 1779, the parish of Olney in Northamptonshire was in the care of John Newton, a devout clergyman and composer of one of the world's best-loved hymns. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Most of us at one time or another have heard or even sung that most famous of Newton's only hymns. But what's really amazing is that the man who wrote those pious lines was for six years a highly successful slave trader, shipping hundreds of Africans across the Atlantic from Sierra Leone to the Caribbean. We today are, of course, repelled by slavery. What we find hardest to understand is why a Christian like Newton wasn't. But Newton justified slavery to his wife Mary by denying that his African prisoners had any understanding of religion, love or liberty. The only liberty of which they have any notion, he assured her, is an exemption from being sold. How could you lose your liberty, went the philosophy of the time, if you didn't know what liberty meant? The numbers involved in this trade were huge. We tend to think of the British Empire as a product of white migration. But nearly three and a half million Africans came to the New World as slaves transported in British ships. That's over three times the number of white migrants in the same period. What are you doing here? What are you doing here? Don't do that. Don't pay me. If migration turned North America white, it turned the Caribbean black. Slavery made overwhelming economic sense. Planters here in the Caribbean could make immense profits from the cultivation of sugar. But the labor was too arduous for indentured servants from Britain. You needed slaves from the tropics. And that was why planters were willing to pay eight or nine times what a slave cost on the West African coast. Well, even a born-again Christian like John Newton could hardly ignore a markup like that. <laughs> 
booming sugar business was the phenomenal success story of the 18th century economy. By the 1770s, sugar alone accounted for a fifth of all British imports. And the only way to produce it was with slaves. Slavery was an ancient institution, but it was being revived to satisfy the needs of the world's most dynamic economic sector. Here, in the oppressive tropical climate of Jamaica, you needed men you could quite literally work to death. One contemporary rule of thumb was that a planter with a hundred slaves had to buy at least eight a year just to maintain his stock. And average life expectancy of a new arrival from Africa was less than ten years. That was the appalling human price of sugar, the white man's white gold. The original Spanish word for a sugar plantation was ingenio, engine, and they were like engines. They used powerful machines to crush the sugar cane. So this was more industry than agriculture. But with a difference. The black slaves were the raw materials. Unlike indentured servants, there was no freedom for them to look forward to at the end of years of labor. Their colonial life was nasty, brutish, and short. Still, it would be wrong to portray all the Africans who were sold into slavery as merely passive victims. Here in Jamaica, a great many fought back against their white oppressors. In fact, slave rebellions were almost as common as hurricanes here. By one count, there were about 28 between the acquisition of the island and the abolition of slavery, though most were fairly quickly and ruthlessly snuffed out. But there was always a part of the black population that was out there, in the jungle-covered hills beyond the sugarcane, beyond British control. When Jamaica was captured from Spain in 1655, there was already a well-established community of slaves who had escaped from their Spanish masters. They were known as the Maroons, a corruption of the Spanish Cimarrones, which means wild or untamed. This was a unique culture, a little bit of Africa in the Jamaican Badlands. The runaways were led by the imposing figure of Queen Nanny, who, according to Jamaican oral tradition, was capable of remarkable supernatural feats. Not least the ability to catch enemy bullets between her teeth. The Maroons repeatedly flouted British authority by launching guerrilla raids to liberate more of their enslaved fellow Africans. Jamaican place names like the District of Don't Look Behind testify to the fear the British settlers felt. The great plantation houses were losing manpower and money. In the end, the British were forced to do a deal with the Maroons. The Treaty of 1739 effectively granted them autonomy in an area of around 1,500 acres. In return, the Maroons agreed not only to stop freeing slaves, but also to return runaway slaves to their masters. So in order to stop the plantation economy from quite literally crumbling away, the Maroons were going to be turned from poachers into gamekeepers. An early example of the way British rule worked. If the British couldn't beat you, they got you to join them. The Maroons couldn't be beaten, so they were bought off. In other words, British rule didn't need to rely exclusively on coercion. It could rely also on compromise. The trouble was, when the challenge to British rule came, not from a bunch of runaway slaves, but from organized white colonists, it proved a great deal more difficult to reach that kind of compromise. Fire! 
It was the moment the British ideal of liberty bit back. It was the moment the British Empire nearly fell apart. At Lexington, near Boston, Massachusetts, one stray shot provoked a bloody exchange of fire between British redcoats and armed American colonists. It was April 1775, and at this stage, London's only answer to colonial dissent seemed to be armed force. Suddenly, even to its own white settlers, the empire of liberty looked like an empire of oppression. <laughs> the war of independence is at the very heart of Americans' conception of themselves. The idea of a struggle against an evil empire is the country's creation myth. But just how badly was the empire treating them? Maybe go inside and have coffee, hot chocolate. By the 1770s, New Englanders were about the best off people in the world. They had bigger farms, bigger families, and better education than the folks back home. To say that the British Empire had been good for these people would be an understatement. And yet it was they, not the indentured labourers of Virginia nor the slaves of Jamaica, who first threw off the yoke of British rule. Why? you are going to eventually rebel. You are going to revolt because the taxes are revolting. Many Tourists are still taught the story of the American Revolution in terms of unjust taxes. But on close inspection, the real story is one of taxes repealed, not imposed. The British couldn't have been more conciliatory. On all the economic issues, they were willing to compromise. Most people assume the celebrated Boston Tea Party of 1773 was a protest against overpriced tea. But in fact, after an easing of British duties on the East India Company, tea in New England had never been cheaper. The riot was organized not by irate consumers, but by Boston's wealthy smugglers, who stood to lose out from affordable official imports. Colonists weren't being ground under the British heel. The burden of American taxation was trivial. The average Briton paid 26 shillings a year in taxes. The equivalent figure for a Massachusetts taxpayer was just one shilling. What was really at issue was the very thing that had driven migration in the first place, liberty. The colonists weren't yet after independence, they simply wanted freedom for their own assemblies to set their own taxes to pay for their own expenditure. They refused to accept that their interests were represented in Westminster. Sam Adams's famous slogan, no taxation without representation, wasn't so much a rejection of Britishness as an emphatic assertion of Britishness. What the colonists said they wanted was the same liberty enjoyed by their fellow British subjects on the other side of the ocean. All they aspired to was to be transatlantic Brits. The tax issue should have been easy to settle. But on the constitutional principle of Westminster's ultimate supremacy over the colonies, Parliament would not bend. That was why, in the Pennsylvania State Assembly Room, revolt turned into outright revolution. Delegates of the 13 rebel colonies adopted a declaration of independence. The transatlantic Brits had become American patriots. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. 
that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Today, it all sounds about as revolutionary as motherhood and apple pie. But at the time, the Declaration of Independence posed an explosive challenge, not just to royal authority, but to the traditional values of a deeply hierarchical society. Although it coined the phrase United States, the Declaration left Americans anything but united. Many felt less bound to their inalienable rights than to their king and empire. The Hollywood version of the War of Independence is of a struggle between heroic patriots and red-coated Nazis. But the reality was completely different. This was a civil war. This is Christchurch in Philadelphia, and it's famous because so many of the signatories of the Declaration of Independence worshipped here. And yet supporters of independence were in a minority in the congregation. Only around a third were in favour, and the rest were either against or neutral. This was a church like so many in colonial America, divided by politics. The pressure on church ministers to take sides was particularly acute. They owed their allegiance to the king as head of the Church of England. One clergyman's inner struggle reveals the truth about this war. Jacob Duché was rector of Christchurch, an Anglican minister. So for him, the American Revolution posed an agonizing dilemma. And we can see here in his own Book of Common Prayer how he tried to cope with it. What the Book of Common Prayer originally says is, we humbly beseech thee so to dispose and govern the heart of George thy servant, our king and governor, meaning George III. Duché took a pen and struck those words out and replaced them with, we humbly beseech thee so to direct the rulers of these United States, a revolutionary act. And yet, when independence was formally declared, and one of the signatories was Duché's own brother-in-law, Duché got cold feet. He backed off, returned to the fold, became a loyalist. And that illustrates how the American Revolution divided even individuals. One in five of the white population of British North America remained loyal to the Crown during the War of Independence. With its loyalist support and its professional army, the Empire should have been able to stamp out the rebellion. Yet despite intermittent successes on the battlefield, it failed to. The reason was that the loyalists' commitment was simply not matched by equal resolve in the old country. The government in London lacked the stomach for a fight against the American colonists. It, it was one thing to take on American Indians or rebellious black slaves, but it was quite another matter to fight a war against what were, in effect, your own people. Incredible though it may seem, many people in London didn't even think the American colonies were worth fighting for. Economically, America seemed like small beer. The value of British imports from Jamaica was five times greater than those from the 13 American colonies put together. In addition, the transatlantic civil war mutated into another bout of the century-long Anglo-French conflict for world domination. With Louis XVI's navy threatening British shipping, a full-scale campaign in America was out of the question. The turning point came in 1781 at Yorktown, Virginia, when the British army under General Cornwallis became trapped between George Washington's patriots and the French Navy. The story goes that as Cornwallis surrendered, the band played, the world turned upside down. The disaster at Yorktown left American loyalists in the lurch. But they weren't sufficiently disillusioned with British rule to abandon it altogether. It's an extraordinary fact that 100,000 people voted with their feet against the new United States, going instead to other parts of the empire, 
Most of them went to Canada, which had the unintended consequence of making Canada ultra-loyal for the foreseeable future. It meant that for some people, loyalty to king and empire came before life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness. The loyalists weren't the only losers. Having won their independence in the name of liberty, the American colonists proved ever more ruthless in their treatment of American Indians and would perpetuate slavery in the southern states. As Samuel Johnson put it, how is it that the loudest yelps for liberty come from the drivers of Negroes? By contrast, within a few decades of losing America, the British Empire turned against slavery. From the point of view of African Americans, the War of Independence postponed freedom for a generation. American independence could have heralded the end of the British Empire. And yet, the empire was far from down and out. Indeed, the loss of the 13 colonies seemed to spur a whole new phase in British overseas expansion, even further afield. So, half a continent had been lost. But on the other side of the world, a whole new continent beckoned. The British had screwed it up in America. Would they get it right in Australia? The British had been drawn to Asia by trade. They'd been attracted to America by land. Distance was an obstacle, but one that with fair winds could be overcome. But there was another continent that appealed to the British for diametrically different reasons. Because it was barren, because there was no one to trade with, because it was impossibly distant, because it was a natural prison. With its weird red earth and its alien life forms, Australia was the 18th century's answer to Mars. The catastrophe of losing America refocused the British imperial effort. Above all, on Australia, which was being explored just as the American colonies began to slip away. Bizarrely, the official response to Captain James Cook's discovery of New South Wales was, aha, what a perfect dumping ground for the scum of the British Isles. The great paradox of Australian history is that what started off as a huge prison for transported criminals ended up being a far more loyal part of the British Empire than prosperous America. In May 1787, 11 ships set sail for Australia crammed with over 700 convicts, ranging from a nine-year-old chimney sweep who'd stolen some clothes and a pistol to an 82-year-old rag dealer who'd been found guilty of perjury. In the following years, around 150,000 men, women and children made the eight-month journey on the so-called hell ships to Botany Bay. But these weren't murderers. They were petty criminals. The British system of criminal justice in those days, a time when private property was the holiest of holies, routinely threw the book at people for offences we today would consider quite trivial. Australia literally began life as a nation of shoplifters. By our standards, the system of transportation seems incredibly harsh. Seven years forced labor for nicking a couple of chickens. And yet, if you survived the voyage and your stretch as a convict, you were in effect being given the chance to start a new life, even if it was a new life on Mars. The elite of the convict population, men with artisan skills, 
were housed in Hyde Park barracks. They slept in hammocks, a hundred to a room. These were the men hand-picked by the governor of New South Wales. They were the craftsmen who would build a proud new colonial city, Sydney. Australia could have become a huge devil's island. It was Governor Lachlan Macquarie who prevented this by giving the convicts a second chance. The prospect of earning their freedom is the greatest inducement that can be held out to the reformation of the manners of the inhabitants. It should lead a man back to that rank in society which he had forfeited. A Hebridean-born career army officer who'd risen to command a regiment in India, Lachlan Macquarie was every bit as much a despot as his naval predecessors. But unlike them, he was an enlightened despot. For Macquarie, Australia had to be more than just a land of punishment. It had to become a land of redemption. Like some benign highland laird, Macquarie dreamt of turning convicts into loyal crofters. Macquarie sought to realise his vision by offering 30-acre land grants to those who'd completed their sentences. The qualities that had got them transported in the first place, the risk-taking, the acquisitiveness, turned out to make ex-convicts ideal empire builders. By 1828, for the first time, free farmers outnumbered prisoners, and soon, sheep outnumbered people. But there were familiar losers in the Australian dream. The bush, where the Australian Aborigines had hunted kangaroo for millennia, was being overrun. Once again, the colonists regarded the land as terra nullius, up for grabs. Paternalist as ever, Governor Macquarie hoped that the Aborigines could be fitted into the new economic order, or as he put it, transformed from their rambling naked state into respectable farmers. In 1815, Macquarie had the idea of settling 16 Aborigines in a small farm at Middlehead, not far from this stretch of coast, complete with purpose-built huts and a small boat. You can see what he was thinking. If convicts could be turned into model citizens by giving them some extra kit and a second chance, then why not Aborigines? But to Macquarie's despair, the Aborigines showed no interest in the well-ordered life he had in mind for them. They lost the boat, ignored the huts, and wandered off back into the bush. They voted with their feet against the British economic system. It was the Aborigines' indifference that sealed their fate. The more they seemed to walk away from the white man's civilization, the easier it was for land-hungry farmers to justify what amounted to a tactic of extermination. This really was one of the most sordid chapters in the history of the British Empire. To all intents and purposes, the Aborigines were classified as subhumans, what the Nazis would later call Untermenschen. There's only really one thing that can be said in mitigation. If Australia had been an independent republic in the 19th century, then the genocide might have been far worse. It was the British authorities, not the local settlers, who issued proclamations on posters throughout the country to affirm the rights of Aborigines. And concern in Parliament about the mistreatment of Australia's indigenous peoples led to the appointment in 1838 of official Aboriginal protectors. That was one of the peculiarities of the British Empire. Out on the fringes, the colonists tended to be totally ruthless towards the indigenous populations. But the government back in London acted as a restraining influence. There was no such restraint when the United States went to war against its Aborigines, the American Indians. <laughs> 
London continued to exert control from the centre. Yet by the 1830s, the new white colonies, Loyalist Canada and Macquarie's Australia, were growing in wealth and self-confidence. The danger was that they might go their own way, just like the United States. The American experiment of going it alone as an independent republic had been undeniably successful. Would the other white colonies now follow that example? Would there be a United States of Canada or Australia? In a way, the surprising thing is that that didn't happen. In 1837, French-speaking Quebecois and pro-Americans rose up in indignant revolt against the suffocating British government of colonial Canada. London's response to the Canadian crisis would prove crucial to the future of the British Empire. Enter, of all people, the Earl of Durham, a high-living hangover from the Regency era and a founder of London's Reform Club. It was this unlikely figure, nicknamed Radical Jack, who was packed off to Canada to sort out the mess. Radical Jack announced his arrival in Quebec by prancing through the streets on a white charger. Yet fortunately for the Empire, Durham found the answer to the colonial conundrum, how to have both liberty and loyalty. It may be something of a slim volume, but the Durham Report was the book that saved the British Empire. What it did was to acknowledge that the American colonists had been right. From now on, power in the white colonies would be shifted fundamentally away from the royal governors towards the colonists' own elected assemblies. In the subsequent years, the same model would be applied throughout the white empire. The Durham Report was the colonists' Magna Carta. Empire had been reconciled with liberty, for white colonists, that is. Durham's blueprint handed down just enough political freedom to the white colonies to produce a durable and cooperative system. It would become the cornerstone of the biggest empire the world has ever seen. It's hard not to feel when one reads the Durham report that its subtext is one of regret. If only the American colonists had been given representative government when they asked for it in the 1770s. If only the British had lived up to their own rhetoric of liberty. There might never have been a war of independence. There might never have been a United States of America. And my Aunt Aggie could have chosen California instead of Canada when she packed her bags to go.